Hi everyone and welcome to the Green Monk Smart Grid Heavy Hitter Series. Uh, I have a guest on the show today from Silver Spring. Would you like to introduce yourself, Raj? Yes, I'm Raj Vaswani. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Silver Spring Networks. Great. Now, Raj, as, as we mentioned in the, in the kind of talk we had before this, um, the four and a half billion dollars of stimulus funds out there now means that everything is a smart grid. Uh, could we try and narrow the definition a little bit? What, what do you define as a smart grid? Well, we, we think that there are really three uh, aspects to that. So at Silver Spring, what we actually do is we build, we provide hardware, software, and services to utilities to help them build out reliable, secure, end-to-end IP networks that connect all devices that produce, consume, monitor, or control electricity. And that's central to what we think of as the smart grid. But really, I think that the smart grid has three components that I just described. There's the grid itself, uh, but there's also the consumer, the, the end user of electricity. So as far as the network, um, you know, saying smart grid seems to imply that the current grid is dumb. And uh, I, I wouldn't say it's really dumb. I would say that it's limited. So when we talk about the smart grid network, we talk about firstly pushing communications deeper into the grid than, than it currently is. So today, for example, in some areas, you may only have networking as far as a substation. But when we talk about smart grid, we're talking about pushing it down to transformers, to switches, and, and even finer grain sensors, like on individual lines to, to check line tension and things like that. The second, then, is that once you push this communication down that far, you're really talking about millions and millions of devices. And so the second aspect of the network is to create a network that supports sort of distributed intelligence that uh, can have these devices communicating with each other out in the grid decisions, making local optimizations, and those kinds of things. So that's the first aspect, is that sort of core network that, that allows uh, the rest of it to happen. The second major component is the grid itself. Um, with using this network, then, uh, you can sort of monitor uh, many more things than you can monitor before. You can get uh, much better reliability. You can uh, improve efficiencies. You can control and adapt to renewables as they come on, electric vehicles. Uh, and all of that wrapped up in grid software that supports all of this additional data that's being gathered, much more than utilities have ever seen before, and also supports that kind of distributed intelligence and, and autonomous operation. Lastly, with the consumer then, the consumer gets really two kinds of benefits. One, one set is indirect. Uh, they, they have a better grid, so it's more reliable. They experience fewer power uh, outages and so on. But more directly now, they start getting more timely consumption information they get to more directly control use, but also respond to programs that the utilities might put in put in a place. For example, time of use pricing or demand response and those kinds of things. And lastly, you know, they'll they'll be able to plug in their electric vehicle and actually expect that it'll work. Uh, we we see a lot there about what a smart grid could be and uh, should be, perhaps, and some of the advantages of smart grids, but. To date, they're still quite notional, aren't they? I mean, uh, is, is there anywhere that you've seen that there's a full smart grid rollout yet? Well, so, yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a good point because uh, a lot of the talk about smart grid today reminds me a whole lot of the Internet in 1994, right? Uh, I think we all saw the Mosaic browser and sort of went, wow, I see where this is going. We're going to be doing banking on the Internet and we're going to do video on the Internet and we're going to do all this stuff. And it took... 10 years to get there, right? And so what's happening now with this, a lot of the core technology is available. A lot of the core standards are in place and they're starting to roll out at, at reasonable velocity. So in the US, for example, one utility uh, has deployed over a million and a half uh, smart meters in the last 12 months. Uh, we've done a number of projects with distribution automation. Uh, we've not done a number of focus groups and, and sort of direct consumer uh, experiments as well. So the, the work is happening, but, but you're exactly right. I, th I think if there's one thing we know about networks, it's that we can't predict all the ways in which they're going to be used. So what's going on with the smart grid today is really the rollout of the basic infrastructure and the sort of tenant applications that, that we all know we want to do. And then over time, what's going to happen is that that's going to create this platform 
for more and more sort of innovation around energy usage uh, that will sort of be what the smart grid uh, can be uh, down the road. Okay, and I mean, you, you talked about the bringing electric vehicles in and home energy portals kind of thing. How long are we talking before those kind of things become a reality? Um, yeah, I, I guess I think, you know, different, different regions also have different drivers, but, but fundamentally I think some of the low-hanging fruit involves exposing uh, consumption information to consumers in a, in a more timely fashion, giving them a web portal, giving them some messaging that allows them to sort of track, you know, get alerts if they're exceeding normal consumption or receiving price signals. A lot of those technologies are, are available and, and, and ready to go and rolling out at, at scale today. But when we start talking about some of the more coming technologies like electric vehicles, those are starting to, to emerge. But I, I guess what I, would, what I would say is that in the same sense of being able to see from 1994 what the internet, where, where the internet might be headed in, you know, 2004, uh, we can see where the smart grid's headed, but it is going to take some time to get there for a, a very sort of core reason. I think utilities um, historically have been treated as if they um, they're not innovative, they're slow moving, and you know don't don't sort of uh, act rapidly. And so everyone's very sort of wound up about when are utilities going to really do these things. Well, I will tell you that I guess in in my experience, um, I, I would say that they are appropriately cautious. Right? If your cable network goes down or your mobile network goes down, you might miss a call, you might miss American Idol, or uh, you know UK's. Uh, but uh, but if your utility network goes down, you might well freeze to death. So, you know, our impression is that the utility industry has been embracing technology at a at a pace that is meshed with, I guess, their their mission, which is fundamentally to continue to deliver reliable energy uh, at the lowest possible cost. And that's something that they've been doing for a hundred years by any means necessary. And they will continue to absorb technologies. Uh, to help them do that as they move through this evolution. So I think what they're doing is they're cautiously testing some of these technologies in, in various areas. They're determining not only the technical aspects of what needs to be done, but the business aspects of what needs to be done. Um, how are EVs going to really be supported? How are devices in the home that might be deployed by the utility or might be deployed by the consumers in a retail model? Who supports those when they break? And, and all of those sorts of uh, you know, nuts and bolts that need to be done to actually get the, to the mass scale. But, but most of the technologies are, are um, starting to roll out at, at pretty rapid paces already. Is the, is the rollout being affected by, for instance, uh, legislative uh, issues? Are there any particular geographies that are further along than others? Well, I would say that um, one of the differences between uh, the, the U.S. and Europe might be that uh, the U.S. seems to be moving very rapidly towards smart grids in, in particular. Uh, in, in Europe, historically, much as in the case of the U.S. until fairly recently, uh, the emphasis has really been around smart metering. And smart metering is thought of as being very kind of central to the, to the smart grid. Um, and it is, of course, important because it engages that, that sort of third leg of the stool, if you will, that the consumer gets, gets engaged when, when they get that detailed consumption information. But, but I think a key question there uh, has been, you know, whether the extent to which smart grid in particular makes sense for Europe beyond kind of smart metering. And that's something that I think a lot of, a lot of people are looking at in, in Europe today. In the U.S., largely uh, that, that decision has been made and people are moving rapidly towards, towards smart grids. So one aspect of sort of regulatory frameworks is, you know, what, what kinds of applications or, or deployments are supported in, at a regulatory level. Uh, in, in Europe, there's one other aspect which is, which is interesting because historically the technologies that have been used for this have been sort of cellular uh, or power line carrier, whereas other kinds of wireless technologies really dominate uh, in, in other areas of the world. And so there is a sort of regulatory framework or a policy framework that could help bring those technologies to Europe and, and actually uh, make them more applicable there. Raj, that's been fantastic. Thanks a million for coming on the show. Thank you.